Dear friends, thank you so much for uh, coming here today. It's, it's really a pleasure. Uh, it's early in the morning, Sunday morning. Uh, but I would like to just spend a few minutes with you to talk about this book. And I said, you know what, I'm going to write about 10 prayers that change the world in a tangible way. Now, I'm a historian. I'm a trained historian. And in, in university, and what I teach my students is that uh, essentially history, the past progress of humankind, is the product of great change. And when we talk about great change, we typically talk about revolutions. We talk about kings and queens who conquer places, right? Great political movements. But we never really talk about the power of spirituality. We never really talk about that. Oh, spirituality. You know, in our world, spirituality is something we do in church. You know, or maybe a prayer before dinner. But it was very different in the ancient civilizations that I write about. In the ancient civilizations that I write about, there was no rigid separation between spirituality and daily life. The two were very closely enmeshed. And the reason why I start the story of ten prayers with the earliest gods and goddesses of Mesopotamia is that that's how spirituality came about. When humankind decided to stop its destructive way of life, hunting, killing animals, gathering whatever wild crops were out there, and started a productive way of life, growing crops, nurturing herds, something shifted in the human psyche, something shifted in human psychology. And that had to do with the fact that it took a leap of faith a leap of faith to think that if I put seeds in the ground now, two or three months from now, I will be able to harvest something that I can feed my family with. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? It took, in, in the human mind, and this is about 100,000 years BC, we think, it took a major leap of faith to make that transition. Of course, it was not from one day to the next, you know. Some dude didn't crawl out of his cave and said, today I'm becoming a farmer. You know, it was a gradual process. And many of the earlier farmers, earliest farmers, continued to hunt a little bit on the side. But that's why the earliest sense of God is all expressed in gods and deities that had to do with the harvest. The God of sun, the God of rain, the God of water, the God of fertility. And so out of these very primitive concepts of a greater divine power that rules our world, slowly but surely came this belief that perhaps it wasn't a whole panoply of gods, that perhaps there was just this one divine presence, this one God. And of course, as scripture tells us, the person in which that cataclysmic change takes place is Abraham. So I start my book with Abraham. Now, for several reasons. One, because I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but the first time the word pray, prayer, the verb to pray, appears in the Bible is in the story of Abraham. Before that, people worship, they make sacrifices, but they don't pray. The word prayer appears for the first time in the story of Abraham. And so I thought, we got to start there. We got to start there. So Abraham is my first story. And you might ask, well, that's all very interesting, but what the heck did he do to change the world? Well, as you may know, we worship Abraham as a great person of faith who was prepared to offer his son just like God would offer his son Jesus for the good of mankind. So for us Christians, it is a foreshadowing of the passion of Christ. He is, of course, the archetype of faith and, and redemption for Jews. 
But guess what? This may surprise you. He is also the great forefather of Islam. Muslims believe that Ibrahim is one of their greatest prophets. And I talk a little bit in the book about it, that uh, uh, Islam believes, and the Quran tells us that after Ishmael was born, Ishmael, remember the daughter of the son of Hagar, the concubine that Sarah gave him, that when Hagar was sent into the desert, according to Genesis, the Quran picks up the story right there and then takes the story into Arabia where Ibrahim and Ishmael and Hagar moved to Mecca. There, Abraham is tested once again. Hagar is left in the desert with her son, just exactly as Genesis tells us. But of course, now the whole thing plays in Arabia. She looks for a well, goes back and forth between two mountains. Then comes the angel Gabriel. This is the Quran telling us. Comes the angel Gabriel, hits a rock, out comes water, and Ishmael and Hagar are saved. And that well is called Zamzam, and that is the core of the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca every year. So there is a tremendous amount that we as Christians have in common, not only with Jews, but with Muslims as well. And it's important in these very fraught times to remember that, that there is so much that we as Sons and daughters of Abraham have in common. I wish the media would spend more time on that than on reporting the atrocities by these extremists because the vast majority of Muslims, as the vast majority of everybody else, are peace-loving fathers and mothers who want to see their children grow up just like everybody else. So the question still for me was, what makes these people, what makes an attorney, a, a barrister like Gandhi, what makes a young go girl like Joan of Arc do these incredible things even though they're pretty much everyday people? Uh, you know, and, and it's an important thing because when you go to the cineplex these days, uh, what we see are all kinds of superheroes, right? I don't tend to go to these movies, but I know there are other people who do these uh, these Marvel comic heroes. We are inundated with these, these powerful people who have supernatural powers, that do incredible things. Well, that's fantasy. What about real life? Uh, here are some of the people I write about in the book. What drove them, these 10 stories? What do these people have in common that allow them to do something truly incredible to, to truly amazing that changed uh, the world. For example, here is this girl, you know. And now imagine a 13-year-old girl living in a village in France, right? She should be playing with her dolls. She should be playing with her girlfriends, doing little dances in this village square. And yet she goes, and for some reason, she finds her way to the court of the Dauphin, the French crown prince, and she says, give me an army. <laughs> give me an army. Why? Because I am going to evict the British from France. This was a time, the Hundred Year War, when the British invaded France, in fact, held much of northern France. Uh, and the French were powerless because the king uh, was mentally unstable. He would die. And so it was up to the Dauphin, the crown prince, who was uh, not a very strong person to save France, and so here comes this girl. She has never held a sword in her life. She has never ridden a horse on her, in her life, right? Has never worn armor, knows nothing about military strategy. And she says, give me an army. That's astonishing, right? You know what's even more astonishing? They do it. They give her the army. <laughs> and she writes to Orléans, which is besieged by the Brits, and she defeats them. Now, what makes a person do that? What makes a person do that? And it's a fascinating story. And, you know, I'm, I'm a historian, but what I try to do is tell these stories like novels. So as a storyteller, I try to tell them as if there's dialogue. And all that dialogue, by the way, is from actual sources, believe it or not, but 
we know more about Joan of Arc than we do about people that lived many, many hundreds of years later. And the reason is that she was put on trial, and the proceeds of that trial were meticulously recorded in French. And I, I was able to get to those records. So everything that you hear in the book about Joan of Arc actually truly happened. Even the words that she speak, the words that the eyewitnesses speak in the book are all based on fact. What I do at the end of each story, though, after I told the story, is I do switch hats and I look at each story from a historical point of view. I say, well, now, this is the story, this is the legend, this is the myth. What truly happened? What is true here? But here we have to be very, very careful because for us, we understand truth in a very different way from people in ancient times, even people in medieval times. You know, we believe it's true. Why? Because we see it on CNN, right? Because it's, we read about it in the paper. And somebody on television says, this is what happened. And a special report, breaking news at 6.30. That to us is truth. But that's not what truth was in ancient times or even in medieval times. Because there was no internet then. There was no television. There were no mass media. The only way in which you could transmit information in those days was through the spoken word. Now, if I tell you a story, and you tell that story to somebody else, and off it goes all around, by the time we come around, the story we all know, right? The story ha gains a new meaning. It may not be factually correct, but what it does gain is meaning. And so I make a distinction as a historian between factual truth and moral truth. Okay, factual truth. Did Abraham live in 1952 BC? Which pharaoh did he give Sarah to? These are things we may not know. Perhaps this is an agglomeration of different tales. But what is far more important is the moral truth of Abraham. The people who told that story from generation to generation, sitting around the campfire, believed in the story because the story encapsulated everything that Israel was about. That is a far more greater truth than the truth of the historical perspective. Well, what year did it all happen? And it's very important for us to realize that because a story gains value for a tribe, for a nation, for a community, precisely because they see themselves reflected in that story. They see their values reflected in that story. So that's how I look at, at these great, great traditions. Are they factually true? Well, in some cases, we can say some intelligent words about that. Or are they morally true? And do they really have a major impact on history as moral truth? Here is another person, fascinating guy, a Roman emperor, Emperor Constantine. Now, this was a pagan. You know, he didn't, you know, he worshipped Roman gods, including the sun god, Saul, which became very important in the fourth century. What made this man on the verge of the greatest battle of his career, the battle against Maxentius, which was his greatest rival for the throne of Rome, what made him tell his soldiers on the night of that battle, on the eve of that battle, paint the ki ro sign on your shield. So you know what a ki ro sign is? Ki ro are two Greek characters, the first two characters of the word Christos. Christos is the Greek word for Christ, which is actually the Greek translation of Messiah. Did you know that? Christos, Christ, means Messiah, the, the anointed one. So what? makes a Roman emperor, who is not Christian, tell his soldiers on the eve of battle, paint this sign, this key row sign, on your shields. And he does. He tells the soldiers to do that. And the next day, he defeats the far more superior forces of Emperor Maxentius. And in the process, wins the throne of Rome. And when he does that, and when he sees that victory, he credits it to the Christian god and shortly thereafter, he proclaims total amnesty for all Christians in the Roman Empire. And that is the beginning of Christianity as we know it. All because of this one battle and this one sign. 
Now I know this particular individual is not too popular in these parts. But when I looked at the missal here in our St. Monica's Church, what was there on page 139? Ein fester Burg ist unser Gott. A mighty fortress is our God. And how beautiful is that? I am so moved by that, that we as a Christian community can take the best of each other's prayers and hymns and share it. I take so much hope from that. And that's why I wanted to tell that story. How did that happen? How did a beautiful song by Martin Luther wind up in a Catholic songbook? And that gives me hope for the future of Christianity, that we can come together as a community and a congregation. So I tell the story how that song came about. Now I'm sure in school you've all heard this story, right? George Washington, Valley Forge, remember that? The man is in trouble. <laughs> the Revolutionary War is in deep trouble. There are no more supplies. The soldiers are fought out are without any ammunition, without food, without dry shelter. And 14 miles across the hills of Pennsylvania is the British Army ensconced in villages. Every soldier, no matter, no matter how low, sleeps in a feather bed, gets a warm meal in the morning served by the local farmers, can you imagine the incredible obstacles, the incredible challenge for a general like George Washington place? Because you know why? The Pennsylvania farmers, I'm sure there were exceptions, rather took the gold from the Brits than the paper money from the American Congress that was worthless. And that's why in Pennsylvania, the British Army found bivouac among all the wonderful villages and slept dry and ate well while the American soldiers were shivering in the cold. And there's this great story where, where George Washington's horse rides into a forest clearing and then suddenly overcome, jumps off his horse, sinks to his knees, and utters a cri de coeur, as the French call it, a cri de coeur, a cry from the heart to God saying, what can we possibly do to save this great enterprise? Now, that's the story I tell. And of course, right after that comes the great, the great tipping point when supplies begin to come through, when a Prussian general takes over the drilling of the American troops, when the first victories begin to appear. But that, that incredible turning point is, as legend tells us, this prayer. Now, as a historian, at the end of the story, I must tell you that there's hardly any evidence for this actually taking place. But is it important? Maybe it's not, because that story has so ingrained itself in our American consciousness that during the great celebrations of 1976, the, the bicentennial of the United States, this story and this picture and this painting was all over the place. And what it tells me is moral truth is more powerful than factual truth. I'm going to leave you with two more quick prayers. This is the most incredible story I have ever told, the story of the World War I prayer. Here is a curé, a, a, a priest in France. We don't even know his name, quite frankly. And he writes a prayer, so, it's a poem so beautiful that it is printed in the local parish bulletin, just like we have a bulletin, you know, they had bulletins, in 1912. And from there, it finds itself on the pew in the Madeleine. If you've been to Paris, you'll know that beautiful church, the Madeleine, where an aristocrat picks it up. You know, he's waiting for mass to begin. You know, and as we do, we typically pick up our bulletin and we start to read the bulletin while we wait for the priest to show up. And he did. And he finds this poem, Make Me an Instrument of Your Peace. Oh, my God. I mean, in English, it sounds great. In French, you just want to swoon. It's so beautiful. And he says, you know what? This could move the hearts of the belligerents. This could move the hearts of Germany, the German Kaiser and the Russian emperor and the, and the queen and the king of, uh, of England. Maybe this one poem 
can make it all stop, this horrible war. And he writes to the Pope, and believe it or not, the Pope reads it and decides to publish it on the front cover of the Osservatore Romano, which is the, the great Vatican newspaper. And so this prayer begins a life. It grows, it grows, it grows, until just in the last couple of decades, it was read again by Margaret Thatcher when she became the first Prime Minister of Britain, by Nancy Pelosi when she became the first female Speaker of the House, by Nelson Mandela as he became the first black president of South Africa. Time and again, great leaders, even pop singers, have put, used this incredible prayer to stir the hearts of women and men. And the most beautiful expression was during the great funeral of Princess Diana, when a huge choir sang those words to a hymn that resonated all over the world. Two billion people read it. So to me, that is perhaps one of the most moving. And finally, the peace prayer. At 10.30, I'll tell you a little bit more about the peace prayer. But how did Gandhi bring about an end to the incredible violence between Hindus and Muslims in 1946, when India, as you know, was partitioned between India and Pakistan, and millions of people, I'm not exaggerating, millions of people were desperately trying to get either to the Muslim part or to the Hindu part, where property was destroyed, mosques were burned, people were killed. In one week alone, 5,000 people were killed in Calcutta. A, an incredible strife. And Gandhi said, we're going to end it on a wing and a prayer literally, on a fast and a prayer. So he, he, he started a fast, and every night he gave a prayer session, which was broadcast around India by India Radio. And he kept at it, and he kept at it, until on the verge of death, on the verge of death, um, Indian National Congress finally decided to uh, end the strife and proclaim Muslims to be protected citizens of India. And that's how India finally came to peace, and that's the nation it is today. So these are the stories that I brought together. And what I found is what all these people have in common is inspiration. You know where the word inspiration comes from? It comes from inspirare, which is a Latin word, inspirare, which means to breathe into someone to breathe into someone. And that, to me, what is what all these people have in common. Whispers from God. That's what I call it. Whispers from God that made them do things that they didn't think they were capable of. Whether they were Christians or Jews or Muslims or Hindu, that is the one thing that as children of God we have in common. Plato called it, the Greek philosopher Plato called it, a spark of the divine. He said, we all carry a spark of the divine in us. You know, in modern terms, you could call it, we all have an iPhone. We all have an iPhone deep in ourselves that connects us to God. All we have to do is pick up the phone and listen. Thank you so much. Thank you.